Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining uh, today's webinar hosted by Figures HR and Assemble. Uh, the topic of today's conversation will be around the challenges of a global location-based pay strategy and strategies for building an equitable compensation program. Um, we put together an extensive report that actually accompanies this webinar. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at the white paper that will be attached as part of the webinar um, to dive deeper into uh, any of the discussion points that we mentioned today. Um, but with that, uh, we'll kick off. I'm, I'm Zach Esrig. I lead the customer activation team at Assemble. Um, and I'm joined by uh, Virgil Renegard, who is the founder and CEO of Figures HR, uh, and Lisa Wallace, who's the co-founder and co-CEO of Assemble. So thanks both for joining. Um, awesome. So with that, you know, as a bit of context, uh, the past few years have forced a lot of international organizations to start thinking and sort of rethinking uh, different ways of, uh, to approach location-based uh, pay compensation. Um, and this has really been you know, driven by uh, the idea of attracting and retaining talent requires you know, a very kind of location-specific uh, pay strategy and being transparent with, with employees around how, uh, how they're approaching that, uh, that, that pay Philosophy, um, and so in this report, uh, we basically analyzed uh, over forty-eight thousand data points uh, from both the figures uh, HR side and the Assemble Compensation Band uh, database uh, to start to bring to life how different organizations are paying employees across geographies. Um, and then we've also teed up some next steps and some actionable points in terms of uh, what to do about this and how to bring uh, these uh, these insights into your location pay strategy. Uh, so with that, um, I will take it over to Lisa to walk us through um, one of the first big insights. Yeah, so I think um, one of the most interesting things that we found that was surprising even to the figures and the Assemble team was the large discrepancy between U.S. companies and what they pay on average and similar sized countries in various countries in Europe similar sized companies of various countries in Europe. So uh, just to rattle off a couple of statistics, um, we found that US companies paid a, in between 1.6x to 2x more than similar sized companies in Europe, um, with the largest gap being in France, actually, um, where the US pays around 2x more than the average company in France. And I'm curious, Virgil, given that you're a French citizen based in France, building your company there, um, kind of what your initial reaction to that finding was. It wasn't overly surprised. I think it's something that's been consistent across the years is like when you look at Europe, well, of course, the gap to the US has been uh, pre present across the year. We don't have the data to back this up, but I'd be curious to see if it increased over the, the last few years with the explosion of tech companies and so on. But it's always been in the sense that UK was the uh, highest paying salaries in Europe. Then you had Germany. Then you had France pretty much as a result line. And this is what our numbers showed. So no big surprise there, I'd say. Yeah, so... Just to, to look at the Germany and UK data specifically, it looks like US salaries are 1.6x those of the UK, so still a huge gap, but not as large as the gap between US companies and French companies. And then Germany is about 1.8x those of um, US salaries, so right in the middle. Is that consistent with what, um, with what you thought? And would you say that that is based on the um, kind of maturity of the tech sector in those respective countries? I think it's, it's like it's, it's tied to uh, partly tied to, in fact, uh, cost of living and maturity of the tech sector. Yes, when you look at that, once again, most mature, most mature market is the UK. Then you have Germany. Then you have France. With France catching up, in fact, fast in terms of maturity of the tech sector. Uh, when you look at funding, when you look at number of tech companies uh, having uh, even subsidiaries there and so on. But yeah, it's been quite consistent across the year, and it's a good reflection of the maturity of the market. Yeah, um, you had a good point earlier, Virgil, too, about the difference between cost of market and cost of labor or cost of living and cost of labor um in yep. uh in Europe because Berlin might even have a lower cost of living than uh than Paris. Do you want to speak on that? Yeah it's interesting, right? We'll get at the end of the webinar on some of the suggestion and actionable insights that uh, we can recommend to companies, right? But one key example of the difference between cost of living, which is how, how much does it cost to live in in a place and like spending power and so on and cost of labor, which is an approximation of the, well, uh, an average of the salaries being paid for given roles in that market. Berlin versus Paris is interesting because in fact, yes, Berlin on average is considered to have a lower uh, 
cost of living than Paris, but salaries tend to be higher than Paris on average, right? So this is why we see that when we talk about comp defining compensation policy, and once again, we'll get back to that, cost of labor is the most interesting uh, thing to have a look at. And the reason why there's this gap, once again, just talked about it, Berlin has been historically a much mature tech market and in which salaries have been increasing in decorrelation with cost of living. Yeah, that's super, super fascinating. And then the, the last finding on uh, on um, just a company level view of comparison is that we actually saw the gap widen um, the larger the company. So looking at similar sized companies that are SMBs between the US and similar sized companies in Europe and SMBs we define in this report as fewer than 50 employees, we actually saw that um, the wage gap was around 1.8x. Um, so U.S. companies paying about 1.8x more than European companies, if an SMB. And then uh, for companies that are over 50 employees, U.S. companies are paying about 2x uh, for European relative to European companies. Which I thought was really interesting that the gap is actually widening the larger the, the larger the company. And I thought, I thought that was interesting as well when you merge merge all those factors, the location and company size. It's like so what European companies fear the most is those giant U.S. companies, right? The whole uh, Google, Meta, Netflix, Adobe, and the like, coming in into in Europe and paying US-based salaries is something any company in Europe can't compete with, right? Like, and it's, um, it's interesting to see the gap is even is the biggest when you compare like European SMBs, seeing talents getting poached or getting approached by like uh, large US companies is like the worst nightmare for uh, any HR person uh, in Europe, I'd say. And I think this gap differs as well, and which brings us to the next point. Uh, per roles and per like job families and so on, right? Um, what we see is that on some roles like products and engineering, the gap is maybe lower than when we looked at customer success and like support roles where the gap was on average 2.5x uh, differences between Europe and the US. So much, much bigger gap than when you looked at product and engineering. And once again, I think it, it ties us back to, um, to like the, the market dynamics, right? We have more and more product and engineering people in Europe that are getting paid like US salaries or for whom who tends to to bring up the market for those roles, product and engineering. Meanwhile, the number of US-based companies paying up European customer and uh, support type of employees, US-based rates is, is, is much, much lower, right? There's not, no, not many reasons to pay customer success or customer support roles in Europe in higher and a higher rate than the local rate and the local European rate, which is why the gap is much, much bigger. Meanwhile, product and engineering, because talent and they're used to more and more remote work in those roles, product and engineering roles, you have talent, European talent that can get salaries have been creeping up to get closer and closer to uh, US-based roles as remote work has become more and more prevalent. I'm not sure if you agree with that. Yeah, I, th I think that's likely. Um, I also kind of wonder if part of the reason why we see such a big discrepancy with customer success roles is that that's one of the first things that you might expand to Europe with if you're a US-based company because you're doing either like a follow the sun support model or something like that, um, or if it's more driven by just cost of labor and market dynamics, like you mentioned. I think both can uh, come into play. But in fact, uh, when we're talking about the prevalence of remote work, I think it's part of our next, uh, our next part, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this was another super interesting finding, which is basically that uh, when we look at remote roles or roles that are held outside of major cities, it seems like U.S. employees get a worse deal on a relative basis relative to their urban counterparts. And we don't see this discrepancy in Europe, despite um, the trend of remote work um, being kind of global um, and just as common between the US and Europe, European countries during uh, during in the aftermath of COVID. So just to look at the specific data here, one thing that was super interesting was that we actually don't see a really large discrepancy in France or in the UK between um, employees that are based in major cities like Paris and London and employees that are remote or based in rural areas. Um, and in Germany, actually, this is so weird, we see an actual 6% uplift um, between employees that are based in Berlin um, and employees that are based outside of Berlin. So I thought that was really confusing. Meanwhile, in the US, um, there's a 22% discount if you're a remote employer or in a rural area relative to being in a major city. So I'm just curious, uh, Virgil, what you think about those results. Yeah, one one of the things we discussed earlier on is like that twenty two percent discount. At first, was I was like that's such a huge discount for differences within the same country. But then 
we kind of realize that when you compare the size of the US with the size of like France, it's so, so damn different. And the differences between states are more akin to the differences between countries in Europe. And then the gap between Paris and Lisbon may be closer than 25% if you look and compare yeah, France and Portugal, which could be a better comparison uh, when looking at uh, this discount and when looking at the US. So that my first point was, wow, the gap is huge. But then remembering that US is such a vast country that uh, is probably akin to some of the changes we have in Europe between countries. And the second thing was interesting, what we've seen is the data. And where we have the most historical data is France. We've seen that gap shrunk, right? It used to be two years ago that the gap between Paris-based employees and like remote-based employees in France was around 12%. And now I think it's like close to four to five percent or something like that. So and it's creeping down, right? It's like it's slowing, getting lower and lower because more and more companies are starting to, and we're going to really discuss about that. I think at the end, it's like going from a location-based approach. So I'm paying Paris people different than I'm paying remote-based people or people outside of Paris, which I used to do when I was in HR. The norm was that you take salary range out of Paris, and for someone living or working anywhere else, it was like minus fifteen sometimes minus 10%, right? But now the norm is moving towards a, a, like a nationwide type of salary range. And people in France would be paid those ranges that might be aligned on Paris or as France as a whole. And I think this is a reflection of the data showing that at least in our data set is that this, 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 this gap between like people based in Paris or people based in Berlin or people based in London and remote workers start to slowly shrink. But I think it's the case also in your data, right? Yeah, so we are seeing a lot of compression, despite the fact that there is a big discrepancy, we're seeing the same compression in US roles that we're seeing in European roles, which is that basically, secondary cities are starting to look more like San Francisco and New York. Um, and then also remote workers in general are getting an uplift by the shift to remote work. It's just not as pronounced as uh, maybe the lack of discrepancy that we see in European countries. Um, maybe something to mention, though, is that I, I love Virgil's point that, you know, the U.S. is a giant country because it really is re on a relative basis um, when looking at these other countries. And um, the discrepancy of 22 percent seems really large, but it's still rural employees are still on average making more than um, employees outside of the United States. So if you're a multinational company, you're probably still likely to be paying um, U.S. employees in general more than uh, more than employees in Europe for better or for worse. Um, move yeah, on? move to the transparency part, right? So what's interesting beyond looking at just like gap comparison between salaries and so on is like seeing the trend in pay transparency, which is a pretty hot and burning topic, at least interestingly enough in the, in the US. And I think I'd let you talk a bit more about that. But from Europe, most people don't see it that much, right? Most people don't see it as a, a topic that's coming up and a very important topic, despite um, despite the, the, the regulatory uh, framework and like environment changing, right? So you, you're going to talk about the changes in uh, in the US, but what's coming in Europe is going to be mirroring the US in terms of the law and regulation changes and forcing companies to want more pay transparency. And when we look at pay transparency, right, we, we ask all of our customers, so um, what level of transparency do they have when it comes to compensation, when they're on board figures and we have like 1,000 plus uh, customers now? And what's interesting is that we ask, how transparent are you about your compensation policy? Meaning, do you out, do you share your target positioning, where you want to be on the market and things like that? Do you share your salary ranges? Like, are you open with at least part of your salary ranges towards your employees? Or are you even trans transparent around individual salaries, right? Individual salaries is only, which is quite kind of large, 11% of the companies that answered our survey says they're transparent and individual salaries, right? Which is the case, by the way, that figures, meaning everyone can access everyone's salaries. But then when you look at transparency in compensation and transparency in salary ranges, number one country each time is the UK, right? Then it's followed by the rest of Europe, including France. But then the, the last country, the least uh, transparent country in Europe is Germany. Germany seems to have a real lagging behind when it comes to being comfortable sharing more data around compensation. But once again, with the upcoming laws in the next few months and years that are coming in the European Union, I think they'll have to catch up to the UK, which on average, always in terms of maturity, when it comes to HR and compensation, tends to be above the rest of mainland Europe. So I'm not surprised that UK, on average, UK-based companies are more transparent because on average, they are more structured and more mature, right? So I think they're a bit ahead of the rest of the companies. But yeah. I'll let you talk about pay transparency and the context you have, the burning context you have around the US. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I liked your point about the the maturity of UK companies rel- on a relative basis because that is that is it does make it a lot easier to be transparent if you have uh, robust programming in place. In the United States, we of course saw a lot less transparency overall based on self-reported data, um, but I bet you that that changes over the next 12 months. So basically what's happening in the United States is that there have been multiple states, including California and New York and Washington state, which are huge, huge, um, huge states with lots of industries, um, of all past laws that require disclosure of pay ranges in job descriptions, and then also to current employees if they're within that role. And then there's some other reporting that's associated with it, but there's really been a strong influx of uh, pay transparency legislation across different states and some that hasn't been passed yet, but is in uh, is in the process of being drafted like in Massachusetts. So I'd anticipate that even if it wasn't sort of the norm, especially across the tech industry and biotech and healthcare industries, which tend to be centered in California and New York, even if it wasn't the norm to share pay ranges today, companies are going to be forced to, and it's really going to change the culture over the course of the next of the next twelve months. Yeah, which is interesting because I think um, one thing we discussed is that interesting effect on pay transparency is that it forces companies to get structured, right? Because pay transparency is going to push companies to shed the light on their compensation practices, at least the salary ranges. But I think what's interesting is the what the EU was voted in the uh, 15th of December that most people don't know about yet, yet is that they're working on implementing within the next few years laws that will force the uh, Euro- European Union members to report salary ranges on job ads, but also take be forced to take meaningful action plans whenever they have a more than 5% pay gap between uh, men and women within the same roles and will force some kind of, uh, of ability for employees to request information from their company on me- me- average and median salaries on their given role, meaning that any employee could be like, I want to access to know what's the average salary for my role within the company, right? So those laws are coming up and will force companies to get structured because if you are, you're forced to shed the light into your compensation practices, you don't want to have some skeletons in the closet hanging out in terms of uh, unfairness compared to the market between people and so on, which I think can lead us to the next point is like what companies can do to structure their uh, compensation in a, in a remote setting and in the context of pay transparency, pushing them to, to get structures sooner, sooner rather than later, right? So I think we've yeah. outlined four key actions based on that. Um, I'll let you go over the first one. Yeah, so just to kick it off, I mean, um, every company should have a compensation philosophy in place. It's kind of the North Star for how you should think about compensation and should be consistent. The language should be consistent with the the compensation programming that you put in place. Um, And what really kind of helps with this is it it helps managers and talent acquisition leaders and um, other people that are kind of in positions of leadership or decision making in some way with respect to compensation to be aligned and on the same page about what, uh, what the compensation goals are. And it also helps explain the reasoning behind policies that are in place if an employee is only seeing part of the picture. So um, aligns your kind of managers and leadership around the core goals of your company and how compensation supports that and supports your talent strategy and then helps uh, be kind of the the guide for explaining why compensation policies are the way that they are um, to employees. Yeah, and I think the, the, in bring us the next point, which is once you've defined, and it, it needs to go in that order, right? To define your compensation policy because, and philosophy, because you can't get to the point, which is the point on data, before you've outlined what you want to do when it comes to compensation, right? Well, you need to be intentional with what you want to do, what you want to do when it comes to compensation, but then you need to apply it to the real world. And some people have been thinking that now in this new world with more and more remote work, you don't need to have like location-specific data sets. You don't necessarily need to know your US-based company you're going to hire out of France or out of Portugal tomorrow, you're like, you know what? I'm just either uh, start to apply a, a generic discount or I'm going to have a look at cost of living estimates to help me send out offer in Portugal. That still can't work. It's very much still on average location-based markets. All those numbers that we shared earlier in the webinar show that still differences. It's still a local market, maybe not a local to the location of the city, maybe more and more of a national market, right? At least in Europe, not in the US because uh, we saw the differences between state, but in Europe, it's very much a country per country market. So you need to have relevant local data set because if not, you're going to get challenged by candidates, you're going to get challenged by employees. But where do your data come from? If you just said, oh, we use US-based data and apply the cost of living factor, that won't fly. Once again, you need to have reliable data, location per location, country per country. But I think once you have this data, you have your composition philosophy, 
you can yeah. start putting things into motion and this is where you need to start to get equipped or uh, I'll let you go over the next point, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. I loved your comment though about location-based uh, data sets because I think the findings particularly relative to various functions underscores the need to have some sort of accurate data point um, that can reflect cost of labor. Like if you're, an, if you're an American company that's saying, oh, you know, I could just do a cost of living adjustment really easily based on some publicly available data, you might not actually be as competitive as you think you are um, in a lot of these locations. And so, or, you know, any company that's, a, that's approaching a multinational strategy. So even just in creating your comp philosophy, having something to look at there is super helpful. Um, the other thing we'd say is just, you know, using technology to maintaining, uh, to maintain employee equity, um, and maintain that, um, or just have some like actual data to suggest that your compensation strategy is working like you think it is, right? So the ability to see churn rates or um, candidate acceptance rates across different pay bands or geos, that's a really good uh, way to gauge whether your compensation strategy is working. But companies that don't leverage technology have a very difficult time pulling those numbers. Um, and those are like the KPIs of whether your comp strategy is actually functional. Same thing with um, employee equity, right? So we're not necessarily saying that uh, every employee in France should make the same as every employee in Montana and the United States should make the same as every employee in New York City. But um, you should have a sense that with respect to position and location, employees are paid equi equitably at your company um, and that you have the appropriate documentation in place to justify why uh, those pay, uh, pay decisions are, are different um, if they are in fact different. And it just makes it easier to, you know, monitor with your benchmarking information, regardless of wherever that comes from, and then also uh, make pay decisions over time, especially those that are collaborative, right? So if you're making a pay decision for a new candidate or an existing employee, and there's you know the hiring manager involved, the, the finance leader involved, et cetera, um, all of that is easier when it's done in a real-time kind of collaborative software program as opposed to over Slack or email or anything like that. Yeah, no, I fully agree. And in fact, I can't, I, I mean, of course, I can't, we are, we're both kind of biased. And especially as, mm -hmm. uh, like myself, I, I come to creating figure because of, after 11 years of HR, I wished I had a tool like, like Assemble and, uh, and figures to, to help me manage compensation. So, of course, I can't disagree with the importance of getting structured, especially once again, it's going to lead to the next point, right? Mm -hmm. Once again, the context, and we talk about the regulatory context, right? But more, more than that, and partly because of the regulatory context, more and more people are going to be talking about compensation. They're going to have expectations around, around compensation and being informed and being educated around compensation, right? So because law is going to push it, but then the law is going to force employers to start sharing salary ranges. It gets people talking, gets people talking about compensation. So companies, they have to start like create, creating culture around transparency or compensation. It can't be a black box anymore. And it won't fly the next, in the future in the coming years, if you still have compensation as a black box, we talked. So once you've gone through the necessary steps of creating your structuring, your compensation, being equipped to the proper tooling to manage it, then you need to start the processes of communicating it to probably manager to start with, employee afterwards, candidate afterwards. And the company, and in fact, there's still, um, I think, an opportunity for forward thinking companies in that space to be proactive into communicating. I think once what, what we've seen in like one of our partners uh, in Europe, OTA, has seen that companies uh, displaying salary information on job ads have twice the amount of applicants that those that don't, right? So there's still a benefit for companies that are proactive about communicating to benefit from an employer branding perspective, get more applicants, uh, and even on an employee side, right? Employer branding can benefit. But if you wait until you're forced by regulation to be proactive, to push communicating, we won't have any benefits. And in fact, you might have probably a malus because other companies will be seen as more progressive than you in that space. So once you've been, you've defined all the steps to structure and compensation and equipped yeah. with the proper data and proper tooling, I think you need to start the motion, progressive motion of starting communicating about it, right? Yeah, we're already seeing that in California and Washington. Um, as those laws get passed, there are a lot of businesses out there that, um, procrastinated on on having a plan for compliance and they're in some pain right now. So I imagine everything will get worked out, but it's 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 a lot different to be building a program in advance um, and be kind of from an employer brand perspective and and everything being seen as a first mover than it is to struggle to try to figure out what the minimal compliance requirement is and and uh, and try to meet that when you're out of compliance. <laughs> Contrary more. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Virgil and Lisa, for leading us through this conversation and the insights. Um, I also wanted to just quickly thank um, Rudolf Dutel, Sarah Lovelace, uh, Mary Jant, and Alistair Frazier, who also contributed to the report. Um, so we recommend that you all take a look at the white paper that we put together. Um, and thank you all for joining the conversation today. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Virgil. Thanks, thanks.